We'd like to thank you for joining us for another episode of Looking to Jesus. I am one host. My name is John Hines. I preach for the Church of Christ here in North Ridgeville, Ohio. I'm joined by... My name is Daniel Sanders, preacher for the Norwalk Church of Christ in Norwalk, Ohio. Where? What are you located close to, Daniel? We're about two hours north of Columbus. North of Columbus, Ohio? Yes. Yes, thank it's you. Columbus, for... Ohio. Are you near any like near any significant attractions like tourist spots? Lake Erie, I think. We're about fifteen minutes south of Lake Erie. You're being difficult today. I'm being difficult. I'm always difficult. That's my You're cha- you're you're changing it up. We know what you're near. But anyway, you doing all right? Doing all right. So we are in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter five. Last week what did we talk about last week? Marriage and Oh, yeah. And keeping our oaths and love and all sorts of different things like that. Lust and all sorts of things. Yeah, we were talking about marriage last week. So this, this was so we're we're going from marriage to then talking about dealing with hatred and things. <laughs> Retaliation, vengeance. Things, <laughs> things along those lines. Love your enemies. Yes, all the principles of marriage as well continues on. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. So we're in Matthew chapter 5. You want to read it or do you want me to read it? Oh, you've been reading the last couple of weeks. You might as well. You're on a roll. Oh, I see how you are. Yeah. I see how it is. Matthew 5, 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other one to him. Turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you and from him who wants to borrow from you. Do not turn away. Verse 43 now, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even tax collectors do the same. Um, Do not even tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. I've preached on this before, and I think loving your enemies, would you say it's one one of the hardest things to do? Probably the hardest thing for people to do, especially in our culture, especially in our culture today. Where it's it's so hard for many, and not just saying just people that are outside the body of Christ. I think it's even hard and difficult at times for those that are in the body of Christ to have different ones that have been difficult to you, that have been your enemy, uh, to be able to try to love them, to try to not hate them, you know, or to try not despise them. Uh, it is a, a very difficult standard to be able to do it because we have a tendency of one to follow with what the culture is, which kind of gets us into the first uh, section of verses here where we want to be able to get vengeance. When someone does something to us or something or hurts us our way, the mentality has been ingrained in so many that we're just to be able to go and get back at them, but then kind of go a little bit further. Yeah. And and sort of putting our place, uh, putting ourselves in the place of the Lord. Yeah. You know, um, and it's it's hard. And um, you, you want to talk about, you know, those first few verses, verses 38 through 42, where it talks about, you know, whoever compels you to go one mile, go with them too. Um, do you want to talk about what most people talk about, just dealing with like Rome, like Roman soldiers and stuff like that? Yeah. I'm sure you've heard that before, oh, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Where Rome would say, you know, you're going to have to go so far and carry a load so far. And then you know, Jesus saying, if someone tells you to do this, to have that oath, Go with them the extra mile. Take it a little bit further than what has been asked of you. And that's what Jesus is trying to get at is, you know, it's not a, it's not an issue for someone to be able to uh, to just go. The, you know, we're, we're just trying to set the stage for something greater, something better, something that we all are to do as Christians of being able to go 
the extra mile and to be able to, you know, you know give what you can. Uh, you know, if someone wants to be able to try to to take your cloak, give uh, or try to take anything from you, give them your cloak also. That that would be that would be extremely hard to do. You know, in this country, just imagine if you were living back in the 1770s and the British soldiers. Yeah. And if a British soldier, if if you are not a loyalist and a British soldier wants you to do something or tries to compel you to do something, um, you're going to run into this verse pretty quick. Well, that's what the Christians were dealing with. Yeah. It's like Rome is the occupying, they're the occupiers. Right. They're the oppressors. And for the Lord to say, don't resist them. Actually, if they ask, if they, if they require you to help them, help them. Yeah, and actually help them more than right. It's like that. Well, that, and that'd be hard to do. That's the thing is when we look at this because my know, point is we we read that passage and we're like, oh yeah, that would be easy to do. No, if if all of a sudden if a country took over America, and they started compelling us to help them, we would defy that with every fiber of our being, and it's like and it'd be wrong. Look, I you know going from a historical uh, point of view. Look at what happened in Germany during World War II. Right. You have a leader that was trying to destroy the Jewish population. Did you have an upheaval on it? Yes, you did have it. It didn't come into fruition really more until later stages once it was really kind of going, you know, once the momentum had really picked up. Yeah. You had a lot of people that were going along with it. And it's it's and just so uh, many, you know you you see it 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 was easy to it's easy to be able to do it's actually harder here here are the Jewish people and again I'm not I'm just using from historical yeah context of looking at what happened here's the Jewish people they were kind of following some of that they were you know someone was compelling you to do this they were doing it and then they were also kind of going a little bit above and beyond trying to and we see the uh, genocide attempt of everything right. there in in that area in that country and in neighboring countries as well. That that is a hard situation, and I'm that that's just my point. It that, is, and it's like, whoa, wait a minute! You want us to actually, if someone compels you to go one mile, go with them too. And if you're a Jew living back in biblical times, you're like, man, isn't that kind of aiding and abetting the enemy? And it's. Now he's about to talk about loving your loving your enemies. Yeah. And that's just hard to do. Also, I wanted to read that quotation in verse 38. You've heard it said, an eye, an eye, eye for an eye. Excuse me, and a tooth for a tooth. That comes from Exodus 21. And and the passage is not really concerning um, you know, government oppression and things like that. But this is Exodus 21 at verse um Verse 22 is one of the references that, that my Bible gives. If, uh, let's see, where's 24, the actual? 24. Pardon me, verse 24. Um, but w- within the context, verse 20, if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. And it's like, is that wrong? Uh, not under the old law. Verse 22 if men fight and hurt a woman with child so that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the man, as the man, pardon me, as the woman's husband imposes on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. But if any harm follows, then you shall give him life for life, eye for an eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. I don't know of too many people that would argue with that. Yeah. Well, and that kind of ties along with the whole idea of vengeance. There are, you know, we're, we're able, you know, here's, here's that passage talking about going the extra mile. Yeah. We also read that we're able to defend ourselves, you know. Oh, well, we're already going to, we're going to have to talk about this, aren't we? Daniel? Well, I'm just, I don't want to bring it up real quick because, you know, Jesus, when he was take, talk, talking to the disciples, you know, said, you know, when you go out, take the money bag. What else did he say to take with him? Take a sword. If you don't have one, make sure you have one ready to ready to equip yourself. Jesus right. in her teaching these things. It's a matter of being able to defend yourself, but not seeking revenge, not seeking that retaliation is what Jesus is talking about. You know, here it is. Yes, we're allowed to be able to defend ourselves, but if someone does something wrong to us, don't sit there and try to 
go at and destroy them or try to take vengeance on yourself. Here, as you're reading here in Exodus, you read about you know vengeance going along with what's being said back in our Matthew passage. Vengeance belongs to God. God executed vengeance in in numerous ways, whether he was giving the law on how to be able to handle such things when you're dealing with certain issues, how you're able to pursue such things. So he executes vengeance in that way through the word that he has given. He's also, as we look, taking matters into the government, being able to, you know, Romans 13, 4, talking about how God uses government governing officials to be able to execute wrath or execute vengeance here on earth. Or in the final stages of life, God also executes judgment, uh, vengeance on those on the judgment day. Okay, so, so go ahead. Sorry. Didn't so there's off. different methods of of God executing judgment and how we're to be how we can be able to handle such things, allowing God and what He has given us through His Word, through the governing officials, through you know Him being if it, if if it all somehow fails throughout this world, He's going to execute judgment there in the end as well. Right. We stand for God, and we're going to be judged according to our action. Do you think it's it's fair to say that the Exodus passage and the law itself, the old law, that God was dealing with them nationally? It's like they were a nation, yeah, and they needed laws, yeah, and that here as we think about our individual role, it's like no, the nation, governments, those who are in authority, Roman, like I said, is it Romans thirteen? Do yeah. not bear the sword in vain, right? It's like they have their job to do. Yeah, and God and, puts it in order. You yeah. Know, do we agree with all the principles of everyone? No. R- no. But and, there's moments it's all to be able to remember God. But anyway, go ahead. And, and the government, it's like good grief. If the government has a law on its <coughs> books that says we are not going to punish evildoers, that's not good. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's what the government, that's what Romans 13 specifically says, that they bear the sword to punish evil. That's their role. That's their role. That's God's role. Like you said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's not my role. And so we're, we're getting, I wonder if, because you have to, you know, to read the Exodus passage, you think, well, that sounds pretty good. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. And it is, if, if it's being, what's the word I'm looking for? If it is, if it is the right party. Um, if it's acting, bearing the sword, if you justice, will, justice, proper justice, I yeah, think maybe what you're looking um, at, perhaps proper justice or just roles. Vengeance doesn't belong to me; it belongs to the Lord. Those who are in authority; they have a role to play. As as for me, and I wonder if that's not the Lord's point. We're getting into individuals. Yeah. Well, when you look at this, and you made a good point about it as well, that you know, prior to this, it was just a small group of people that we always talk about when we talk about it in Genesis. Whether it's Abraham, Aaron, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, you start you start talking. Did I mention? Did I say Aaron? If I did, I didn't mean to say Aaron. Anyway, way to I'm go! Jumping I'm jumping. I'm jumping ahead. But you're dealing with individuals. There's not. I mean, God. Right. God Patriarchal reveals, dispensation. God. God reveals His word to and His law, and you know it's revealed to to these fans. Now you're talking about a nation. And I right. think that's an important thing to take note of because when we pick up in Exodus, Egypt has, or not Egypt, Israel has grown there in Egypt to being multiple nations because now you got all the different sons of Jacob having their own tribes basically right. at that point and being their own followers and being their own, in their own groups and everything. Now we have a whole nation of individuals that are needing, you yeah. know, kind of here's the law and it's here's all going to apply to all of you. Right. And it needs to be revealed by Moses, by the by the law and the prophets, Moses being one of the mouthpieces, and we see other individuals as well, taking the law to all the people to be revealed on how God wants things taken care of. Well, would you say to look at verse 43 back in Matthew 5 again, you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. To look at this transition, and the point always gets made, um, even even here, the you, you shall love your neighbor, that's a quotation and hate your enemy. That's not a quotation. The Lord did not want them to hate their enemies, even in the Old Testament. There's a difference between justice and hatred. Yeah. And that the Exodus passage is dealing with justice. And justice has its, like we said, the party who serves it, the Lord, the government. But as far as us, so these first few verses in Matthew 5, it's like, okay, don't resist an evil person. 
if you're persecuted for righteousness sake, especially if you're persecuted for righteousness sake, um, for conscience sake, you need to endure it. Now there are times where, and this is, man, this is a whole nother, this is a whole nother episode. (laughs) It's not wrong to defend yourself. Yeah. There's a reason the Lord told them to get a sword. Yeah. There's a reason for that. And I think you can show from the garden what the, when when the appropriate time to use a sword is. is because when they come to Jesus with swords and he says, why are you treating me like a, a thief or a robber? And it's like, well, how do you treat someone who breaks into your house and tries to steal you? Yeah. Steal, you know, why do you? And, and so that's you have the right to defend yourself. But anyway, that's a whole nother episode. Yeah, no, um, I, I just, but I'm when not you're, trying, I'm when not trying you're, to open up that can yeah. of worms with everything, I just want to be able to just take note of you know sometimes when we look at the man, when we look at the retaliation side from verse thirty down to verse forty two, it just kind of makes it feel like you have to be a complete doormat, right? And that's not right. what it is. It's a matter of okay, you got you got sometimes where you're going to have to show that subjection, that meekness. As we look at this, you know, not being a doormat, but showing meekness, as we read earlier in Matthew 5, verse 5, blessed are the meek for what they shall inherit the earth. There's a sense of gentleness. And here's some of that explanation, I believe, looking at this in that gentleness, being able to go that extra mile and being able to, you know, go the extra mile, show your extra, show the other cheek if someone slaps you on the one, being able to give someone your cloak, being able to go that extra mile so to speak, with everything. Do me a favor. Look at verses 38 through 42. Yeah. Something just occurred to me, and this is this is a preaching point, because some people will look at that passage and they'll say, oh, it's calling for pacifism, okay? And like you use the phrase doormat. Yeah. And that whole idea of, well, you just, you just lay down and take it. But all of those verses there from verse 38 down through verse 42, those are all active verbs, it's not telling you just sit back and take it. It's actually yeah. telling you to do something. Turn the other. Let him have your cloak. Go with him too. And from him who wants to borrow, give to him. They're active words. Yeah. They're not passive words. And it's like, no, this is what you do. This is your this is your reaction. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's not just, oh, just lay down like a doormat. No, the, that's not what the Lord says. He doesn't want you to lay down like a doormat. Yeah. He wants you to get off your backside and actually do something. Yeah, and there's there's greater there's greater purpose behind what we're looking at, and I think that kind of leads into uh, when we talk more about this next part about the loving your enemies. I think, yeah. you know, because I, I sit there and start camping a little bit in Romans twelve, in looking at some of the things from Romans twelve, and we'll look at that here. Okay. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get into the next part about, about loving, loving our enemies. And again, and again, real quick, as we talked about, as you mentioned, asked there to be, this is hard. Yeah. This, this is difficult. It's easy to love your friends. It's easy to love your friends. It's easy yeah. to be able to love those who love you. It's easy to be able to greet those who greet you. It's like even the tax collectors do that. Exactly. <laughs> and that's what, you know, and I did, I did a series on questions. Jesus, and I looked at this question. Do not even the tax collectors do the same? Kind of that whole mentality of everything. The tax collectors who were looked at by Jews as being thieves, robbers, heathens, basically the the scum of all scum, below scum. And here was, they would go and greet these people. It's Jesus Christ saying, if you greet those who greet you, if you love those who love you, if you just are going to do those do good things for those who do good things for you, yeah, you're just like the tax collectors. That's kind of an eye-opening statement. To He's saying honest. everybody does that. Yeah. Everybody but does to, that. But to be able to love your enemy, this is where it, it, this is where you the, the being able to take it that extra mile, not seeking vengeance. Because what do we want to do when we have our enemies? We want to seek vengeance. We want to be able to right. to watch them, you know, so to speak, suffer. We want to see them. We want to kill them. Get them. Get them hearted. We want to kill them. We want yeah. to be able to just you know we have that that extreme disdain and hatred for these individuals. And here Jesus says, "You've heard this, but I say to you, love your enemies." That Hard word yeah. to do. That word love there. It is the word agape. It's not phileo. Yeah. It's it's that agape love. And so to start with, I think sometimes people might be, it's like, well, okay, you compel me to go one mile. I guess I'll go two. Yeah. You ask for a cloak. I guess I'll, you know, and it's like the, the verse about be hospitable without grumbling. Yeah. Some people, exactly. they, they only do, they do good, but they grumble the whole time. Yeah. And 
it's like, no, we have to do this out of love. Yeah. We love our enemies. And it's like, how, why would we love our enemies? How is it when someone's speaking to you ill? When it says, you know, bless right. those who curse you, those who are speaking ill of you, and maybe doing it behind your back or even doing it to your face. How hard is it to be able to bless them? So right. we, we, I think we could probably all say, well, we've all been guilty of it before where you were just like what you were talking about. You get those clenched teeth. Fine, I'll give them a blessing. I yeah. won't speak. <laughs> it's you like know. when you have kids that are fighting, you know, and you make them, you make them hug it out. And it's like, oh, they're real happy about that. Oh, yeah. You sit there, you watch them hug, and they're sitting there. You know, they're, they're like got their eyes closed with their head far as far away as they can, trying to reach in there and try to yeah. try to touch one another and, and give that hug and everything to try to yeah. work it out. That's what it's like, you know, for for individuals, uh, you know, and those like, who hate you. It's like that a love, you, uh, you know, you <laughs> people who despise you or speak evil of you or want to do harm or have done harm to you. Yeah. What does it say there? He says, do good. That is so difficult for us to do. And to be able to say, you know, those who abuse you, those who use you, those who yeah. persecute you, those who physically harm you. Right. Was it pray for them? Yeah. I, I've heard I've heard people say um, in explaining this passage, and I think it's wrong uh, how they how they explain it. Sometimes they'll say basically they'll say fake it till you make it. And that's somewhat paraphrased. Yeah. But what they say is if you have enemies, OK, you may not love them. But you need to pray for them and you need to, you, you really need to pray for them. And it's like, it's a whole, it's my, a whole, my, uh, my point is it starts with love that if you yeah. don't love them, if you don't love them, you're already starting on the wrong foot. You yeah. have, you have to love them. You have to realize it's like the Lord loves his enemies and yeah. the Lord loved us and died for us when we were enemies. Yeah. He doesn't didn't die for the righteous. He died for us. Yeah. And that when we were enemies, Christ died for us. And we have to get ourselves in that mindset that the Lord, okay, if the Lord died for his enemies and that God so loves the world and that's sinners, <laughs> it's like we have to we have to we have to get in that mindset yeah. of loving people that are unlovable. Because the Lord loved, loves us. When we go into the mentality of I, I have to love you, but not like you. When we start saying, we say those things sometimes. You know, yeah, I know. We 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 are already it's putting wrong. ourselves. <laughs> yeah, we may we joke about it. We may say, uh, Bible says I have to love you, but it doesn't mean I have to like you. Yeah. That's, that's that's already that's already you know you're you're doing things grumbling about it. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And so. It's not easy. It's not easy. And I'll, I'll say this. When you get into, if you only love those who love you, you have to, what it does is, it's like you, you only do good to those who do good to you. Yeah. And it, it gets into that reciprocal relationship. What that gets into a relationship of is works. It's like, I only love you because you do what is right. Well, that's works-based love. Yeah. And we're about grace. And what is grace? Grace is unmerited favor. Grace is loving those who do not deserve love. That's grace. And it's like, why should I love them? They don't deserve it. That's why it's called grace. They don't deserve it. It's unmerited favor. God demonstrates his own love towards us while we are still sinners. Christ died for us. You reference there Romans 5, and that's verse 8 there. Yeah. Yep. For even when we were, verse 10, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. Much more having been reconciled, we should be saved by his life. There you go. So, and we're we're supposed to be like the Lord. Yeah. We are imitating the Lord. We are, if we will do these things, we will be sons. We will, we will be perfect just as our Father in heaven is perfect. Verse 48. Okay, so the first one, love. The second word that's used, love your enemies, bless those who curse you. That word bless there, it's an interesting word. It's not the word for pray because you have pray in the next passage, yeah. in the next the right. next phrase. That word bless there, in the original, it's it looks like the word eulogy. Okay. It's eulogio, if, eulogy, however you pronounce it. And we know what a eulogy is. It's like when you do a funeral and you do a eulogy, what are you doing? 
It's like you're, you're speaking about the person. You're speaking about the person. Yeah. And usually it's not in a bad way. Yeah. You're giving an account of them trying to trying to trying to be cordial with everything. Yeah. And you're not slandering them. Yeah. You're not gossiping about them. That's for the open mic night, though. Matt. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. That is not for the after funeral part. That is not for the after funeral roast. That's not what it's for. Wrong. Wrong. And it's like, no. So you bless them. And it's like, wait a minute. You mean you actually speak well of them? It's like, yeah. What we're trying to do is we're trying to overcome evil with good. That's what we're trying to do. That's the ultimate goal. You know, when it gets to down in verse 46, if you love those who love you, what reward have you? And when we think about the reward and what we're looking for, certainly there's an eternal reward. But also when we think about what we're trying to do, we don't want them to remain enemies. It's like we're trying to convert people. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to draw them to the Lord. Why does the Lord send the rain on the just and on the unjust? Why does he do that? Why does the Lord bless his enemies? It's because he wants them to recognize his goodness. He wants them to turn to him. That's what the Lord's trying to do, and that's what we're trying to do. We don't want them to remain enemies. So, no, we don't gossip. We don't slander. And that's where, you know, that whole thing where we talked two weeks ago about anger. When someone has an issue with one another, people talk about open mic nights. Uh, yeah, like uh, you take you know when you're about to bring your gift to the altar, instead of taking your gift to the altar, you go right. and resolve be recon- as it says, or be reconciled first to your right. brother, then come off for your gift. We're talking about reconciling enemies. Yes, we're reconciling our enemies, loving our enemies, trying to be joined with our enemies. Right. And, uh, the Beatitudes, blessed are the peacemakers, yeah. for they shall be called sons of God. Yeah. Bel- believers are the salt and the light, that they may see your good works and glorify God. It's yeah. like the effect that we have on others. So it's love your enemies. So we think about the motive and bless them. It's like speak well about them. And that's, oh, that's hard. Yeah. Because it's easier to focus on the cloud rather than the silver lining. Yeah. And it's, that's really hard to do. <laughs> it is. It definitely is. Being able to try to sit there and talk about the individuals in, in such a way of looking at the good rather, I, than, rather than focusing on, even if when it's when it's personal, when it's someone that personally does that to you, it makes it that much more difficult to do. I don't, and I, you don't, it can't mean, it cannot mean that you ignore problems. No. It cannot mean that it's wrong to criticize even. And, and I'm just in my mind, I'm thinking of what Jesus says about Herod. And I can't remember what they say, like Herod's looking for you or something like that. And Jesus says, go tell that fox, I have this to do and that to do. Yeah. And he, he's on his way, of course, to the cross. Was it wrong for Jesus to say, go tell that fox? I'm not going to argue with Jesus. <laughs> um, But... At say, but be angry and do not sin. Exactly, it goes back to that principle that we talked about a couple of weeks ago, of being able to, you know, can we have anger? Can we express moments right. of anger? Absolutely, right. we can, but not trying to provoke or agitate sin. It's I think it's all laid out for us here in those same principles. Once again, don't retaliate. Right. Don't don't seek vengeance. That belongs to God. Love your enemy. Do good. Do you have to rebuke someone every once in a while? Yes, but do it in a way where you do not agitate one each other, yourself or the other party, to give in to or pursue sin. Have you already quoted Romans 12? I, know I said you... we were going to mention some things there in Romans 12. Like doing this lesson, looking things over, I was thinking Romans twelve seventeen down to verse 21. I'll read those verses for since you read earlier. Yeah. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, here it is again, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heat coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Yeah, the whole figure there in verse 20 is you're trying to soften someone. Yes. That, that's you're the not figure. trying to heap 
literal coals of fire right. some not, people want to try to look at. You're not trying to infuriate them. Yes. You're trying to soften them. Yeah. And you're trying to overcome evil with good. And so that's the next one on our list back in Matthew 5. You love them. You bless them. You do good to those who hate you. Like, man, you, you got to do good. It's like you have to put love into action. That that's that's what you have to do, and that that's what that Romans passage is talking about. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. As for us, and, and this is this is one of those places where we we are called to imitate God. Yeah, but not in everything. Right. Not in vengeance. It's like nope. That's his end of the stick. Yeah. That our our part is to do good, and, and we do that because God does good i guess it should have included verse 16 there in romans 12 where it says be of the that kind of leads every kind of ties everything be of the same mind toward one another. that whole idea of reconciliation yeah of being of that same mind to one another. don't set your mind on high things but associate with the humble with that meekness with that gentleness with that subjection but also do not be wise in your own opinion right you know, what what do we see when we see retaliation we value our, our opinion and we kind of hold it up there higher and then when we think about retaliation we think about vengeance that goes above and beyond. We're valuing ourselves higher than the right. Lord or putting it above God and his word because then he says, don't seek vengeance because I will take vengeance. I will execute wrath on whoever it may be. And again, I believe as we look at that, there are multiple ways where he executes vengeance or wrath here on earth, but also in the final stage of life as well for those that do not know him or obey him. Sure. So we have loving, blessing, doing good, and then we have praying for them. What would you say, so what should we pray for? I, I think there's some things, you know, 1 John 5 talks about there are some things we should not pray for. You know, when it talks about there's a sin leading to death, there's a sin not leading to death. The sin that leads to death, he says, I do not say you should pray for that. And most people explain that passage in thinking about repentance. And if a man is unrepentant, well then... He, he's not looking for forgiveness. And so I would pray, suggest... You pray for peace. Pray for... Yeah, pray for peace. There, there's multiple pray. ways of being able to pray for, to try to soften it in a different... Going about it in a different way. Whether you pray for peace, pray for reconciliation, pray for yourself to be able to be gentle with everything too and handling such situations or yeah. showing that humility. There's ways of being able to... Pray for wisdom. Still ways of, yeah, pray for wisdom. Being able to pray for... Uh, different ways or methods to be able to try to still pray for patience, patience, patience. the Lord's patience, opportunities. Yeah. Pray for a lot of things. It doesn't mean you have to say, Lord, please forgive them, even though they're unrepentant. Yeah. We're, we are seeking to, their forgiveness. You don't ultimately pray for to, to strike someone down either. You know, yeah, yeah, that's James, <laughs> that's James and John. And I mean, this is, the, this is the issue. That's James and John in that Samaritan village. And they're like, Hey, you want us to call fire down? Yeah. And the Lord's like, you don't know what kind of spirit you're of. Yeah. I didn't come to kill. I came to save. I came to save my enemies. It's like I came to save everybody. And so do good for them and pray for them. And there, there's a quote. I can't remember who said it. It's it's extremely hard to curse your enemies after praying for them. Something along those lines. And And I think that's true. That it goes along with what said over in James three, you know, blessing and cursing, or right, blessing right. and cursing coming out of the same opening of your mouth. It should, should not, not be, be so. That way. Yeah. Yep. So if if we find ourselves cursing our enemies, odds are we're not praying for our enemies. Yeah. Sometimes we can play the hypocrite and try to do both, but it should not be so, according to according to James. So we love them, we bless them, do good, pray for them. And I think the account tells us why, yeah. why we should do all these things. And one is it's because we want to be like the Lord. Verse 45, that you may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Children are like their parents and we want to be like God. Yeah. And it's like, well, okay, God loves his enemies. So how should we be then? Yeah. And it, it's really just that simple. There's no partiality with God. So there should be no partiality with us. And so you you have that I you have that idea. And again, 
we are looking for that reward. We're trying to change enemies. We're trying to overcome evil with good. We're trying to change enemies into friends and draw them, draw them to the Lord. Man, all that's hard. It is. It's, it definitely is. But then we see there's a reward for it all. Yeah. You got to go through, you got to, you got to trudge through the mud and, and through the difficult times. And here's one of those difficult times or difficult circumstances. But therefore, as we look at verse 40, therefore you should be perfect as your father in heaven is perfect. And we see there's a, a reward in the end of being with him and being able to try to help others be with him as well. Being able to show that love, hopefully softening the hearts of others to be able to seek this better path of serving God. Do you think this is one thing? This is, this is a thing that gets in the, that, that sometimes churches, churches that are struggling or that have struggled in times past. And you look, it's like, what has been, it's like, what's been the problem historically? You know, you look at when the church started, it's like, man, the church was, was growing in the Bible. And you see that the church there in Acts 2, and it, you know, it pretty much ends with, and they had favor with all the people. And it's like, wait a minute, how, how did they have favor? What, what were they doing? And I think what they were doing is what this passage is talking about. And it's like they weren't just loving their brethren. They were loving others. Yeah. They were doing good for others. They were having an effect on others. They were doing that for each other, but they were also doing it for others. They were greeting their brethren, but they weren't only greeting their brethren. They were they were having an effect on others. And when when churches, you know, have trouble with that, and it's like people get their you have animosity in a church. Let me put it like that. You have animosity in a church. And if that animosity is not overcome with this, and it's like, oh, well, I'll, I'll just get my nose out of joint and I'll go someplace else. That's not overcoming evil with good. No, no, it's not. <laughs> and, you know, someone, and it's like, we all, we all get hurt from time to time and we hurt others from time to time. And this is how you... This is how you deal with pain. This is how you deal with animosity. And it's hard. <laughs> I, I come back to this is like the heart. This is the hardest commandment. Yeah, it definitely is. It definitely is. I've heard people there's, say there, repent. There, there's that. But then, you, you know, you've kind of opened it up a little bit right there. Can someone be able to go somewhere? Or do they have to sit there and just take it all the time? There's a moment where you can be able to say, okay, I can't, I have to move on for the, for the sanctity of everything. This is going to be a whole nother episode, Daniel. Yeah, I know. I because know. at some point the sermon's not over yet. No. Because at some point you come over to Matthew chapter seven and you have the verse, you don't give what's holy to the dogs. Yeah. And it's like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. You have the verse, beware of false prophets. Well, wait a minute. So I'm supposed to beware of some people and I'm not supposed to give what is holy to the dogs or cast my pearls before swine. I thought you just said we were supposed to love everybody, hold hands, sing kumbaya, yeah. and, and call it a day. It's like, eh, it takes more discernment than that. Yeah. And you do what you can, but like I said, that's a whole other episode. It is. As it some, is. Sometimes you got to shake the dust off your feet. You do. There, there's a, there's moments where you, you, know, you have to just shake the dust off and move on. Can you still show that love for one another? Yeah. Yes, you can. But Doesn't, then, doesn't mean you hate them. Yeah, it, it actually says in the, the shake the dust off your feet passage, it says shake your dust off your shake the dust off your feet, not your seat. Shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. It will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than them in the day of judgment. And it's like, let the Lord deal with it. Yeah, you, you got to let it go. Don't hate them. Yeah. Don't, don't be bitter about it. Um, Do what you can to to overcome evil with good. But if they are not hearing you. If they're not, if they're not interested, some there there may come a time where you have to shake the dust off yeah, your feet. Absolutely, and that takes some that takes discernment. That takes discernment. That's where you sit there and you pray, pray about it, meditate on it, give time to it. Hey, and I will say that's also very hard it is. to um to shake the dust off your feet. Yeah, because what you're saying is what what you what you're saying is I'm sorry you're lost and I've done everything I can to do it, but I got to move on. Yeah. That's hard. That is. <laughs> and um that is. Because you do love them and you want what's best for them, but they're they're making their choices. 
So anyway, the the passage there in Matthew 5 about loving your enemies, don't put it in a vacuum and don't, you know, there, there are other passages that, that deal with issues mm-hmm. just, just like that. Yeah. But at the same time, we love our enemies mm-hmm. and we bless them. We do good. We pray for them because that's what, that's what our, that's what God does. Yeah. God blesses and loves. So you got anything else in your notes, Daniel? No. Nope. All right. That's everything I have. So appreciate the good study. Yep, appreciate it as well. Thank you. Yep. Thank you everyone for listening. We appreciate it. Appreciate the comments um, that folks have made. Uh, we appreciate you listening and studying along with us as we open up God's word and look unto Jesus. Thank you very much. Uh, we will, I guess I should mention, yeah. we're not going to be here next week, right? Yes, correct. Well, so two weeks from now will be our next. So it'll be next year. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So we'll be back. We'll be back in January. In January. Yep. Gotcha. So hope everyone stays safe. And and again, join us two weeks, two weeks from now. Um, but thank you for joining us for this episode of Looking to Jesus. Thank you.